I'm pleased to welcome back to the show Jim Rickards, best-selling author of multiple books, to discuss your newest book, Sold Out, How Broken Supply Chains, Surging Inflation, and Political Instability Will Sink the Global Economy. Jim, it is so great to have you back on the show. Welcome. Thank you, Julie. It's great to be with you and uh, very uh, obviously excited about the book launch. Uh, you do a certain number of interviews, but the books may come out every year and a half, two years. So you get to the launch date. It's, uh, it's very exciting, but thanks for having me on. It is very exciting. I already pre-ordered it and I encourage folks to pick up a copy. Um, it comes out on Tuesday. And uh, I think the best place to start, Jim, is where we usually start. And that's with your macro view. I'd love to hear your latest thoughts on the global economy and of course, the domestic economy here in the U.S. Sure. And it's it's interesting the way the book feeds into exactly that subject. In other words, what's going on with the, with the global macro economy and so forth. Uh, when I started, um, you know, obviously I come from an economic background. I've done it for years, um, you know, monetary policy, central bank policy, um, and geopolitics and other aspects of, of, uh, of macroeconomic policy. And you, you jump into this supply chain, which is what the book is primarily about. Um, and you say, well, okay, that's, yeah, clearly it's economic, but there's, you know, logistics and uh, operational research and other aspects. And I was researching all that, but I quickly, pretty quickly realized that supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. Um, you know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread, you know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. It's like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrapper or a paper wrapper? Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Uh, where the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer. Where the driver come from? Somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know that well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know where did that come from? And then you find out that the ovens are you know industrial ovens have parts from twenty five different countries and 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 so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and and everything else and really what's called the extended supply chain and you're like wait a second that's that's a, a huge number of countries a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy which it is and then every link in that supply chain i described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth um and then that's for a loaf of bread well, what about you know your alarm clock, your car, your furniture, your clothes, and and, and on and on and on. Again, I mean, you, you see the point that once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the uh, it's the, the the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So to get back specifically to your question, Julia, um, the uh, you know the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process, and I have whole chapters on that talk about uh, China, um, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, yeah, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Clearly, the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia um, that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, uh, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, um, you know, et cetera. And then you, again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft. They need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? And again, not to belabor, but you can go kind of on and on there. China, um, you know, everyone says, well, they, they've uh, slowed down because of the, the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. You know, zero COVID, the way it works in China is uh, uh, if there's one case, one person gets COVID, they quarantine that person and you're locked in your apartment for, you know, two weeks or so. Three or four cases in, in a neighborhood, they'll lock down a whole building or a whole neighborhood. 20 or 50 cases, they'll lock down a whole city. 
And they have. Uh, Shanghai, a city of 26 million people. Beijing, a city of 22 million people. They were both locked down entirely uh, earlier this year, last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers. People had to get to work. They had um, you had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old, which meant you had to be tested like four times a week. Uh, they had they set tents on every other street corner, every third street corner, with with uh, these COVID testing centers, and they, you could get your results online, carried around on your iPhone or Samsung or whatever. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns, and obviously very very detrimental to the economy. Um, it got so bad that uh, around the end of November, there was a, a tragically a fire. Uh, no one knows how many people were killed. This is in an apartment building. No one knows how many people were killed because the government of China suppressed the information, but estimates kind of low and maybe 50, but it could, could have been a lot more sadly. Uh, but one of the reasons they burned to death in the fire was the fire engines couldn't get to the building to put out the fire because of all these COVID roadblocks. So this was a, uh, an unavoidable or sorry, an avoidable tragedy made far worse because of the COVID lockdown. So this led to, to riots and demonstrations all across China, it started in one city, but spread very widely. And it started to get the look and feel of almost like a Tiananmen Square uh, protest. And that was June 1989, when there was a massacre following that really shut down US-China economic relations for about four years. I was traveling in China at the time, you know, 91, 92. I never, never saw an American. Um, yeah, there were Brits and Germans and Aussies uh, uh, around, but and I was in central China, Wuhan and uh, uh, Shangsheng and Xi'an and, and elsewhere. So it wasn't like I was you know, sitting downtown Beijing, uh, but um, but you couldn't find an American. So um, so it's it's kind of that extreme. Now, those have died down a little bit. And China is saying, um, well, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. That's just a, a sop. It's just throwing a bone to to avoid more social unrest. Uh, but then you see, you know, in U.S. stock markets, there's a Chinese uh, large cap ETF that's been rallying a little bit. You know, Wall Street says, well, if China's ending, ending zero COVID, uh, the, the economy is going to approve, so buy Chinese stocks. You know, typical Wall Street analysis about, you know, paper thin in terms of, uh, of depth. Um, but it misses a, a lot of things. Number one, um, these are central orders coming from the Chinese Communist Party. They push them down to the localities and they say ease up a little bit. But let's say you're a mayor or a local party official or just a city, you know, block captain or whatever, uh, Communist Party cadre, and you take it easy a little bit because Beijing said so, but then there's a huge outbreak, uh, which there may very well be. So all of a sudden you'll get, you can't win if you, if you follow orders, um, but things get out of control, they'll blame you. They say, well, you, you were too easy. You no, know, is this always your fault? So, uh, and that can lead to consequences. At best, you know, your career is derailed and maybe you end up in jail or, or end up dead. Um, so it, it's sort of, it's one thing to say it and the Wall Street takes a superficial take and buys Chinese stocks. It's another thing to understand the reality. The, the thing with the virus is none of, none of what I just described, the zero COVID policy, and the relaxation and possible consequences, et cetera. None of that has anything to do with medicine or, or public health. That's not science, that's just ideology. Um, as far as public health is concerned, the virus, it's a respiratory virus, it goes in the air, you, lockdowns don't stop it. There's good evidence that the best thing you can do for, for COVID is uh, get outside with no mask and get some exercise and fresh air and sunshine. But that, uh, that you know, and plus basic stuff like washing your hands, uh, that, that stuff works better. When you lock people down, you create incubators and the virus spreads even faster. So um, so this is not going to work. Um, and so then you say, well, what is the solution? Well, the, the solution for China is the same one it was in the United States and Europe, which is called herd immunity. You kind of, you know, you can have all the, the, the treatment centers and hospital beds you like, but at the end of the day, you kind of have to just let the virus rip. Uh, the fatality rate is quite low. Um, it's you know a fraction of one percent, like one quarter of one percent, so ninety nine point seven five percent survival rate, which is you know better than the flu. Um, and uh, uh, but in large populations, you'll ha you'll sadly have some deaths. Now, if you let the virus rip in China, you know the, the numbers. It's, the math is pretty simple. It's one point four billion people. If you assume a thirty percent infection rate, which is probably reasonable. 
you get to something like 420 million people get COVID. Uh, and then with a one quarter, 1% fatality rate, you get to about a million dead. Well, that's to, that's sad, but that's to be expected. That's how these things work. But eventually you would get you would get past it. But what does it do when you have a million dead and millions more in hospitals and they don't even have enough hospital beds? That's a separate source of social unrest. So China's in a no-win situation. If they continue zero COVID, they're in the process of destroying the economy and you get social unrest because people don't like to be locked up. But if you relax that and let the virus rip, um, you'll get past it eventually, but you'll have a million dead in the meantime and an overwhelmed medical system. And their vaccines don't work. And actually our vaccines don't work, but their vaccines don't work uh, uh, even as well as ours. And none of them, none of them work. None of them stop the spread. None of them stop infection. So they're not really vaccines. So uh, you can kind of say, well, we're going to make different choices in China. But my point is none of them are good. You're either destroying the economy and creating social unrest or letting the virus rip and creating social unrest for different reasons. So, and China has problems anyway. If there was no COVID in China, they would be collapsing anyway because of real estate, demographics, uh, corruption, pollution, um, you know, and, and higher oil and gas prices, inflation, and they're draining U.S. dollar reserves. So they're, they're, they're an economic basket case with or without COVID, but COVID makes it worse. Europe is already in recession. It's going to get a lot worse. You know, I hate to use cliches, but um, I guess it was Game of Thrones. They said, you know, winter is coming. Well, winter's here. Uh, it's getting very cold, very fast in Europe. They don't have enough energy. The U.S. and U.K. together blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, that's not going to be a source of natural gas. Uh, and now they put this cap. Uh, I say they, meaning NATO, the U.S. and EU put a cap on Russian oil prices. Well, the one thing we know about price controls is they never work. Like they just never work. You can guarantee the price will be higher because you'll create shortages and move things to the black market. So Europe's in a recession, going to get a lot worse. China's in a recession, going to get a lot worse. Japan just kind of be, falls victim to everything else we're describing when consumption is down, there's demand destruction because of higher interest rates. Japan, Japan's an export powerhouse. Well, guess what? Their exports start to you know shrink drastically because no one's buying their stuff. Same for South Korea. Um, and um, so what we're looking at, Julia, is a, a global recession. And those are rare. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, you know, Germany's in a recession or the U.S. is in a recession or Japan. You know, Japan's had nine recessions in the last 30 years. They're in a, a 30-year depression is a better way to describe it. But uh, but usually there's some economy somewhere that's doing OK and kind of, you know, actually they, use, they used to use the phrase locomotive. It's the locomotive that pulls the rest of the train, uh, you know, out of the ditch or up the hill, as the case may be. Uh, but a, a global recession, which we did have in 2008, with the exception of uh, Australia, Australia seems to be recession proof, but um, but they did have a recession in 2020. But we're looking at a global recession and. Uh, that would be if we're lucky. If we're not lucky, we'll have a global financial panic on top of that. So um, this is the the bigger picture, the macro picture, but it's it comes at the same time that we see a supply chain breakdown, and that that's what the book's about. But the book does pivot into uh, it really has two sections. The first section, three chapters on the supply chain, you know, kind of anecdotal stuff about you know what's actually happening. Uh, the second chapter on why the supply chain broke down, what caused it, et cetera. And then a third chapter on why it won't come back together. There'll, there'll always be supply chains, but this the future supply chain will look very different. And right now we're kind of in a muddling through period and not very efficient period. But then the second part of the book is about money and it has two chapters, one on inflation. And we all get inflation. You know, I, I always say, I'm, I, maybe an analyst, but I put gas in my car and shop for groceries just like everybody else. So I, I get the inflation side of it. But I have a separate chapter on disinflation and deflation. And that's coming very fast. And no one's ready for that. Um, you can see it coming. But right now, everyone's kind of got the, the inflation mindset on. Uh, but the deflation is coming very quickly. Jim, I think that is a fantastic outline for this entire uh, discussion. And that's why I love just giving you the space to elaborate um, on your views. Um, you talk about how the supply chain is the economy, and it's a great way to understand the economy. And so I, I took that away um, as you were explaining uh, the different parts of the globe. And I think it would be helpful um, 
to maybe like dive in a bit more, you were talking about the different chapters. So let's talk about like why the supply chains have broken down, why we've seen these frailties emerge, and also would love to hear your thoughts on why we won't see it come back together as we knew it before. Sure. I'll do the uh, I'll do the second part first, but I'll elaborate it when we uh, when I get through the why and the how. But it's kind of like if you had a really nice vase, Julia, and you you knocked it over or broke it into five thousand pieces. Uh, you can't put it back together. You you can go. You got to go buy a new vase. Uh, there there comes a time when, and this is true of all complex dynamic systems, when they break down, they break down. I, I say water doesn't run uphill. Uh, the river doesn't run backwards. Uh, you can't get back to where you were. You can have uh, a new supply chain, but it's going to look very different than the old one. And again, I'll talk about that um, uh, specifically. I, I make the point, I do this in the introduction to the book. I say, look, supply chains have always been around and, and they always will be. I mean, even you know, I think Neolithic people did a little trading here and there as so they had their own kinds of supply chains. And I point to an example. Uh, there's, a, there's a Bronze Age shipwreck. It's uh, dated uh, to about 1200 BC. Um, and it was a vessel that was in a, a, a counterclockwise coastwide trade around the Mediterranean. So it would go from kind of the present day Middle East to, uh, you know, Turkey and, uh, and, and Greece and uh, Italy and so forth, and then come back along the North African coast to, you know, Carthage and, and Egypt and back to Phoenicia. Um, but this boat, this uh, this vessel sank uh, off the coast of Turkey in a place called Ulubaron. It was discovered by a Turkish sponge diver uh, in around 1980, uh, give or take uh, early 80s. Uh, and uh, he he just said he saw some funny looking jugs with ears. I mean, they were kind of handles. But he said these jugs with ears are down there. And he reported it, and they engaged in a 10 year underwater archaeological um, you know dig or exploration. And it was the, the richest Bronze Age shipwreck ever discovered. Now, the point is, in the shipwreck, they found amber, which comes from the vicinity of the Baltic Sea. They found gold, which at the time came from Sudan. They found swords and other weapons, which were made in kind of present-day Damascus and the, the Phoenicia, present-day Israel and Syria. And they found uh, olive oil and olives and figs and other foodstuffs that would have come from from Italy or Greece. Um, oh, and they found a, a carving of a Queen Nefertiti that was probably uh, headed her way in Alexandria. And so, so the point is, when you when you map out all the places where all these goods came from, it goes, you know, Baltic Sea is not that far from the Arctic Circle, Sudan not that far from the equator, as far east as Persia, present day Iran, as far west as present day Spain. It's an area of five million square miles. And goods from all parts of that uh, space were on this vessel. So there's your supply chain. It was in a single vessel that was picking up cargoes, dropping them off, uh, but covered a vast area. So, okay, so there's a Bronze Age supply chain of great complexity and great depth. They've always been around. So so what's new? What, why are supply chains breaking down? What kind of, what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. Um, the first was you had a combination of um, uh, increased computing power, um, algorith algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, better data collection, so uh, a new model. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the, the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries, uh, and Central Europe, or sorry, Central Asia, you know, because there is the stands, you know, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, um, and Kazakhstan and, and other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. Now, technically, you know, Mao Zedong died in 1976. Deng Xiaoping really started economic reform in 1978. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down US-China 
relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. Um, it was kind of, they were persona non grata. The two countries were, were, um, uh, you know, distant. And uh, it was George H.W. Um, uh, Bush was president at the time. And it was just a cold, cold spell between U.S. and China. Again, that, that's actually when I was there in China. I, I traveled quite a bit there in 1991, 92, and Wuhan, uh, Shangxing, and, and, and uh, Xi'an, and elsewhere. Uh, and um, uh, as I said before, you couldn't find an American. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics, China kind of re-enters the game, and all this this was this was globalization. I've been doing international economics, international finance. I worked at Citibank, you know, at that time in the set in the eighties. So we had international relations, international banking, et cetera, but it wasn't globalization. Globalization didn't really, you know, Russia had to enter the game, China had to enter the game, the Iron Curtain had to come down, all these things had to happen, and they did. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, uh, um, you know, London to, uh, to to Hong Kong, of course. So so this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. And it worked. And so this was a period um, I call supply chain 1.0, 30-year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, what? why did it break down around 2019? I mean, and I, I talked to people, uh, I talked to one individual in particular, I was CEO of a Fortune 10 company. He was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. Um, you know, there were a lot of people involved, of course, but uh, but this guy was really a leader and is recognized as such. And he told me, because I, I interviewed him for the book, he said, Jim, you, see, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form. And I think that's that's exactly right. So um, to your point, Julia, what was it, you know, around 2019 that that did cause it to break down? Well, really, um, three things. A lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, "Oh yeah, COVID that disrupted everything. That was that was the problem." And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, "That was the problem." And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it. Made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. Now I don't want to debate. The tariffs, that's a policy issue. I happen to think they were the good idea and overdue. A lot of people disagree with that, but it doesn't matter. He did it. Um, and so he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on uh, appliances and solar panels. Now, technically they were global, but most of that stuff was coming from China. So this was really a shot aimed directly at China. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do to strike back? Well, at the time, uh, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them. And China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? Uh, and the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. I mean, you got you got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities. If you're a, a, a cargo vessel operator, um, you got to redirect all your routes. You know, you got to break long-term contracts, et cetera. The, the point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the U.S. to Brazil. 
Um, beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts. They want five year contracts or at least three year contracts. And they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil. But this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the U.S. farmers doing? Well, they were like, hey, we, 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 we're still growing the soybeans. We can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, OK, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. But once again, you know, instead of Port of Los Angeles, you're using Port of Houston or um, Port of, uh, you know, Port Elizabeth near New York or, or whatever. But and then this went on and on because because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So and it escalated from there. And by the way, there's very good data on this. It, it's not just a theory. Um, I found some research, which I, I mentioned in my book uh, and, and give the source for that. Uh, but it's a it's a book uh, by um, by Lorianne Larocco, uh, who's a, a maritime cargo expert. And what's interesting about what she did I mean, this data is available. We know where the vessels go. We know what's in them. We know when they leave and when they arrive. They all have GPS connections and people keep track. So you can look at all this data. So she tracked what I just described, which was this rearrangement of orders and supply chains, what they call transportation lanes and all that. But she, but here's what's interesting. She finished her book around December 2019. So it's like a controlled experiment in terms of pandemic, because if you had written the book later, You'd see the disruption, but you'd have a very difficult time. Well, you know, how much of that was tariffs and how much of that was COVID? You know, you, it's very, when you have two things going on at once, it's very hard to separate the impact. But she has no COVID in her research because it was pre COVID. The book was done before COVID outbreak occurred. So it's a pure case study of the impact of the tariffs. And you can see the breakdown then. You can see the breakdown in 2018, 2019. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just you know kind of an arbitrary date for the 30-year period of supply chain 1.0. Now we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in-between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't sort of got the new vase, so to speak. We haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just, we're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. Um, so I, I suggest in the book, this is at the end of the book, but again, a lot of evidence to back this up that the new supply chain or what I call supply chain 2.0 starting, you know, coming soon, um, will be what I call a college of nations, meaning there will still be outsourcing, there will still be trading partners, but it'll be like a club, they'll be friends. So they'll, they'll be kind of liberal, democratic, you know, advanced economies. So it'll be, you know, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, EU, UK, uh, some other countries, I expect India will be part of it. Brazil will be part of it. Um, and they'll form their own trading blocks. And you know, Janet uh, Yellen has called this uh, friend shoring. You know, instead of offshoring, you have friend shoring. You give, you have trading relations with your friends, but not others. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, has called it a, a, a constellation of nations. He envisions a new kind of EU, but not just like the existing EU. Maybe that would include the UK and others. Um, but what that means is China is not going to be in the club. China is, you know, atheistic, communistic, genocidal. Um, you know, abusive of human rights. Uh, I could go on and on, but, you know, you take the point. Uh, they're going to have to put their own block together. Uh, and so you'll end up with a multi-block world. Maybe some countries like Brazil will trade with China and the U.S. Um, there'll be some over, over some linkages, but uh, but really the, the advanced developed economies, the democratic societies, and even developing economies that happen to be democratic, such as India, Will be in will will be in this one club, and they'll trust each other, but they won't trust China. There'll be some added costs, but it'll be worth it because they'll will avoid the hidden costs. Um, you know, the the supply chain revolution has been driven by efficiency, meaning you know lower costs, which means higher margins for producers and lower costs for consumers. It seems like a win win, but there were a lot of hidden costs, including fragility susceptibility to breakdown, toleration of human rights abuses, 
child labor in the Congo, you know, and on and on and on that we're never taken into account and should have been. And that's the stuff that will uh, start to disappear when you have a, a club of uh, nations or what I call a college of nations. Yeah, I think you pretty much answered my next question. But I do want to still pose it to you because you're talking about we're in the process of rebuilding the supply chain to what you call supply chain 2.0. Um, it sounds like a great decoupling taking place and uh, the forming of new trading partners, the College of Nations, as you put it. Um, so I guess my question for you is what does this mean potentially for like national security? What does it mean for possible, you know, geopolitical tensions um, with the new supply chain networks? Does this create a safer, more stable world? Or um, do we, are we more susceptible to like more fragility or volatility or even, you know, um, more tensions between countries? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Julia. And uh, we've been talking about, you know, the supply chain is the economy. And uh, we've been talking about logistics and trade wars and transportation lanes and a lot of other things. But this feeds right into uh, national security and geopolitics. There's no, you know, it used to be they were kind of separate subjects that occasionally intersected, but now they're like, they're, they're joined like this. They're, they're practically inseparable. So let's, let's look at a few uh, aspects of that. Um, one of them, I mean, just for example, by the way, what I, what I described is already happening. It's going to take a while to develop and gel a little bit, but it's already happening. For example, in, uh, in the, in the past few months, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, T TMS, uh, TSMC, uh, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor producer in the world, um, has uh, announced a, a $10 billion plus um, uh, investment in a semiconductor fabrication plant in Arizona. Uh, and then they came out and said, we're going to do another one. So perhaps tw as much as $20 billion of investment in semiconductor plants. By the way, Intel, um, which is a US company, announced also a $10 billion semiconductor plant, new one that they're building in um, in Oregon. So uh, Intel had the ability to do that overseas if they wanted. They could have, could have built that in China and uh, Taiwan Semiconductor could have expanded their facilities in Taiwan. So why are they both doing this in the United States? Well, because Taiwan, Taiwan Semiconductor is looking at the possibility that China could invade Taiwan. And the U.S. military has developed a doctrine which we call the, the broken nest theory. Uh, and ironically, it comes from a Chinese proverb, which is, um, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? And the answer is they can't. Um, and as applied to military affairs, what that means is this. If China invades Taiwan, Leaving aside whether the Seventh Fleet will interdict it or whether the U.S. is drawn into war, that does seem likely, by the way. But but that aside, uh, we cannot afford to let the Taiwan Semiconductor technology and facilities fall into the hands of the Chinese communists. We won't. So we'll destroy it. We'll blow it up. Now, the Taiwanese may blow it up themselves. If they don't, we will. But either way, if the Chinese succeed in their invasion, they're going to get there. And everything I just described, the the, the, the manufacturing facilities, the technology will be gone, burned to the ground. So Taiwan said, well, we better build something in the United States uh, so that even if China does invade, we as a company survive and can grow our technology. So you can call that onshoring. It is a kind of onshoring. Well, it's not. It's onshoring for Intel. It's not onshoring for Taiwan Semiconductor. It's really offshoring because they're coming to the United States. But they're looking at it in a geopolitical strategic context, which is hey, we better get out of Taiwan just in case it's invaded by China. But this goes to my point about the College of Nations. The U.S., it's not that the U.S. won't have any trading partners. Of course it will. But it'll it'll be a short list. It'll be, you know, again, Australia, Japan, Canada, and a few others. And Taiwan is saying, U.S. is our biggest customer. Uh, why not? We're worried about a Chinese invasion. Why not move to the United States? That, that's one example. Um, another example, there's something called um, CFIUS. It's a government agency. When you say SIFI, as people say, does it itch or burn? But uh, it's an acronym. It stands for uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Uh, and a lot of my work uh, for the intelligence community involved working with SIFI. Now, this is a multi-agency um, body. Um, it's uh, housed in the Treasury Department. So the Treasury Department takes the lead. But it includes the Defense Department, the Commerce Department, the the, the uh, State Department, and you know other government agencies. Defense, uh, defense, I mentioned, as you might expect. Um, but the so, but they get to look at foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies. 
And they're not looking at it from an antitrust point of view or an SEC point of view. They're looking at it from a national security point of view. And they're saying, is the acquiring company an enemy or adversary of the United States? And do they perhaps have some bad intentions in terms of buying this U.S. company, either because it'll give them they'll be able to steal U.S. technology or penetrate U.S. Um, um, intelligence networks or uh, research networks, et cetera. And the Treasury doesn't do that work directly. They outsource it to the intelligence community, to the CIA and Director of National Intelligence and other branches of the intelligence community. So we were the ones who had to kind of go out and, you know, gather the data, so to speak, and analyze it and report back to the Treasury. The intelligence community didn't make the decision but they gave the Treasury Department the information they needed so they could make a smart decision about whether this was dangerous or not. Well, that whole network, that whole uh, tool I just described, it's been around since the 80s, but Congress has recently beefed it up. They've expanded the list of transactions potentially subject to review. They've expanded the list of uh, um, uh, standards that apply to when uh, an actual threat might exist. And they've empowered the intelligence community to do more work along those lines. So we kind of have our guard up a little bit in terms of uh, protecting national security and reducing uh, theft of intellectual property. You've seen uh, roundups of scientists and researchers at top universities, um, some of whom have been convicted, not all, but you know, alleged to have been um, involved with uh, the, the Chinese intelligence services or spying on behalf of China, even though some of them were US citizens. and had um access to this stuff they were they were still kind of working for china in different ways so those those networks are being broken up um so the so there's a lot going on but it all kind of whether it's strictly economic which a lot of it is or relates to national security which is definitely a large factor here what you're seeing is you know europe separating itself from russia europe separating itself from china the us clearly separating itself from china What's interesting about that process is it's not a one-way street. China is decoupling from the United States. It, it's not the case that the U.S. is just pushing China off the bus saying, hey, you're out of the club. China's okay with that. China's like, hey, U.S., we don't want to do any business with you either. Um, this has to do with the rise of Xi Jinping. He's kind of a new, the new, the new Mao Zedong. He's emperor, dictator for life. Uh, he's a pure communist ideologue. Does he care about the economy? Yeah, a little bit, but he cares more about Communist Party power and um, Communist Party ideology and his role as the, the English translation of the Chinese character core. He's the core of the party and the party is the core of the country, et cetera. Uh, but this is pure communism. I said, you know, I said 25 years ago, you have people like uh, Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations and Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University and, and others. And they're smart people, but they were running around saying, uh, you know, give the Chinese time, cut them a little slack, don't worry about human rights. Uh, you know, they all went to MIT and Harvard. They're, they're going to be just like us, just give them time. And I always rejected that. I said, well, maybe they went to MIT and Harvard, but they went back there with a better education, and and but, but they're still communists. Um, and uh you know people kind of dismiss that but it, it turns out that was right that they uh they've taken all our intellectual property and our educational uh tools and more um and our direct foreign investment and all of our money uh but they have not deviated one bit from the communist path and now they're no longer pretending to do otherwise and xi jinping has said we'll go our own way without the united states so this this decoupling between the U.S. and China, I mean, two largest economies in the world, um, is, a, is a very big deal. But the consequences are not limited to supply chain and economics. They go right to the heart of national security. And uh, by the way, there's a theory, and I think it's a good one, um, advanced by uh, Hal Brands at the uh, School of Advanced International Studies. It's where, uh, it's where I got my uh, graduate degree in um, international relations and economics. And uh, Michael Becky of uh, uh, Tex, uh, sorry, Tufts University, uh, also their School of Diplomacy, and they they've advanced a theory they call peak China, and it goes as follows. So you ask yourself, you know, is China going to invade Taiwan? Uh, are they going to you know play rough in the South China Sea? Maybe invade Japan? Are they going to do all these things? And people go, well. Yeah, maybe, but they're not as strong as the United States, and they're they're not as strong as Japan. Their navy's not as good, and they're going to wait. 
Um, but if from the Chinese perspective, there's another dynamic going on, which is if you think this is as good as it gets for China, it's not that China is stronger than the United States. They're not. But if you see China on a declining path, which I do for the reasons I mentioned earlier, and if you, if you see the U.S. getting stronger, which I expect it will because of this College of Nations I described, then if you're China, this this may be as good as it gets. And and we saw this in 1939 um, with uh, uh, Japan, you know, basically, you know, well, even prior to that, 1936, invading um, invading China and then running rampant in Southeast Asia, and then finally in 1941, attacking Pearl Harbor. And if you had said to the Japanese uh, leadership in 1941, are you stronger than the United States? They probably would have said no, but this is as good as it gets. We're not, the U.S. is now going to ramp up, and if we're going to strike, we need to strike now. Same thing with Germany in 1914. If you said, was the German Navy as strong as the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy? The answer was no, but they also felt that it was as close as they were going to get. And if they were ever going to go to war, now was the time. So you might have a situation where China says, we're we're on a downtrend, and they are. The U.S. is on an uptrend. It's a little funky. We have a lot of leadership problems, but we're probably going to be the beneficiaries of supply chain 2.0. You might, if you're China, you might say, let's invade now because it's it's not going to get any better for us. And that's a very, very risky world to live in. Yeah. Jim, it is so helpful having you on because I wrote down a bunch of notes of things that I'm going to go look up and research further uh, from this conversation. I do want to talk about money with you because I know that's part of the the book and specifically inflation. I uh, would love to hear, you know, what you're thinking about as it relates to inflation and what's sort of top of mind for you right now. Yep. Now that uh, happy to answer that, Julie, just one quick footnote on the last topic. Um, uh, oh, oh, we, uh, you'll do more research. Hope we get to do another interview, but this is all, uh, there are longer versions of this in the book. Uh, it's not all about trucks and trains and, and cargo vessels. Uh, I, I cover that, but there are long sections on China and Ukraine, um, in the book. So people who are interested can find out a lot more there, but uh, let's go to your question about, uh, inflation in particular. And I have a whole chapter on this. So again, inflation's here. Uh, we all see it. Uh, you know, price of gasoline, uh, eggs, milk, butter, groceries at the store, um, rents, electricity, uh, home heating, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you name it. Across the board, inflation is affecting everything. Um, and it started uh, really in uh, mid-2021. So here we are, uh, almost 2023. So it's been going on for well over a year. Uh, for the first six or seven months, you know, Jay Powell, and for that matter, Janet Yellen, we're like, yeah, we see it, but it's transitory, transitory. We know that story. Finally, in November 2021, Jay Powell threw in the towel, uh, said, okay, time time to retire the word transitory. Now let's get to work. And they um, started raising interest rates in uh, March 2022. And we're now up to uh, Fed funds rate of 4%. Uh, they're going to raise them again in December, uh, December 14th by another 50 basis points. We kind of you know, still a little bit away from that, but we know it's coming. The Fed, this is the no drama Fed. They tell you what they're doing in advance. So uh, I always say, you don't, you don't need a crystal ball to figure out the Fed. You just need to listen to what they're saying and believe them. So they're, they're going to do 50 basis points in uh, December. That'll get the um, uh, policy rate of the Fed funds uh, target rate to four and a half percent, but that's from zero. March 1st, it was zero. So to go from zero to four and a half, in less than nine months, uh, about eight and a half months, that's amazing. We haven't seen anything like that since uh, uh, Paul Volcker in in the early '80s. Now I know rates are not 13, 14 percent, but um, but to go from zero to four and a half, I can say in eight months is uh, is a shock. Now, what's why is the Fed doing this? Well, they they say they want to kill inflation. Okay, but um, there are two sources of inflation. Inflation can come from the supply side. Um, you know, what's called cost push inflation. Costs go up and they get pushed into um, uh, you know re retail prices and, and consumer prices. Uh, and that is what's happening. That's because of the supply chain breakdown, energy uh, prices, shortages of goods, et cetera. So that's 
cost push inflation from the supply side. There's another kind of inflation that comes from the demand side. And this is much more psychological. It's when consumers say, you know, they just have it in their heads and maybe from objective data that prices are going up. And so they change the behavior. They say, you know, I was thinking of getting a new washing machine, but uh, I was going to wait six months, but I better buy it now because the price is going to be a lot higher in six months or a car, you know, suit of clothes, a dress, uh, furniture, whatever it is, better buy it now because the price is going to go up. That demand side inflation is called demand pull. You're basically pulling demand forward because of in anticipation of much higher prices. And and there's a huge difference between the two. First of all, one can feed into the other. This is what happened in the 70s. The inflation in the 70s started from the supply side in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo as a result of the Arab-Israeli war, et cetera. It then fed in to prices, but then there were monetary blunders where the Fed printed too much money under Arthur Burns and G. William Miller, two of the worst Fed chairs in history. Uh, and then that changed the psychology. And then the, then it came from the demand side. And that's when, you know, gold went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce, uh, you know, 2,100% increase. And, um, but it affected everything. I mean, I was starting my career at that time and uh, I worked at Citibank and they, uh, as the International Tax Council, they used to just give us raises. We didn't even have to ask. They would just say, hey, here's another 30,000 bucks or whatever, because they were afraid people were going to quit their jobs, and they did. Uh, so so they would, they would just give you a raise without even asking. That's how crazy it was. Now, so where are we today? Well, we're definitely getting the inflation from the supply side, and that's clear. But so far, it has not tipped into demand pull inflation. Consumer psychology has not changed. We're paying higher prices. But a lot of this um, is because demand is inelastic, meaning uh, you got to pay the higher price no matter what. Uh, if you have to fill up your Ford F-150 pickup truck because you got to get to work or do your job or take the kids to school or whatever, and it used to be $75 and now it's $150 twice a week, you still have to do it. It, it kind of doesn't matter because you need the gas and you need the truck. Now, where it does impact the economy is if you do that, it's $75 that you don't have for something else. In other words, um, you're like, okay, I just paid a lot more to fill up my truck with gas or my SUV or whatever, but now I'm gonna you know, not go out to dinner, not go to a concert, not go to a sporting event, not buy a new suit of clothes, et cetera, because I can't afford it because I put all my money in the gas tank. Um, and the Fed can't do anything about that directly. The Fed does not drill for oil. The Fed does not plant wheat or corn. They do not provide fertilizer. They do not drive trucks. They do not refine diesel fuel. In other words, when you look at all the bottlenecks that we've talked about, the Fed doesn't do any of those things. So they can't affect the supply side of the equation. All they can do is destroy demand by raising interest rates, which they're doing. Mortgage rate, we saw mortgage rates go up and housing prices come down. And uh, a lot else prices are actually starting to come down. We'll talk about that in a minute. But my point being, if, if the inflation is coming from the demand side and you do some demand destruction, okay, that works, although it can be extreme as it was with Paul Volcker. But if if the inflation is coming from the supply side, think about how much demand do you have to destroy to affect the supply side? It's not, it's not coming from the demand side, it's coming from the supply side. The answer is a lot. You have to, con you have to create a severe recession and much higher unemployment uh, to to control supply inflation from the demand side. And Jay Powell has said this. Four times. He gave a speech in Jackson Hole on August 26, a speech at a press conference on September 21st, another speech at a Fed press conference on November 2nd, and he just gave a speech at the Brookings Institution on November 30th. Now they're in the blackout period before the December 14th FOMC meeting. But it's four times. And he said the same thing all four times. He said, inflation, destroying inflation is job one. We know there's going to be a recession. He didn't, he didn't use the word recession, but he, he as much as said that we know unemployment is going to go up. We know this is going to cause pain. He actually used the word pain three times in one paragraph. I've never heard a Fed chair use the word pain before. Uh, Powell has done that. He's been being very blunt about this. So um, so they're out to destroy inflation. But here's, here's what the markets don't see. Here's what the Fed definitely does not see and what very few analysts see. Supply side inflation can feed to the demand side. Demand side inflation can feed on itself. But supply side inf inflation alone does not feed on itself. It tends to destroy itself. There's an old saying, you know, the cure for high oil prices 
is high oil prices. In other words, if you make them high enough, and going back to what I just said about putting gas in your tank, think of all the things you're not spending money on. And that causes business failures, layoffs, higher unemployment, lower velocity of money. You know, you you you, you stay home, like you said, you don't go out basically. Um, and that's what's happening now. So we're starting to see inflation come down. When it comes down a little bit from, you know, 8.2% to 7.7%, you know, people go, well, oh, it's, it's still high. Well, it is still high. But that's a that's a noticeable drop, and we've seen that a couple of months in a row. What's going to happen faster than markets and investors expect is that this inflation is going to come down so fast, it's going to be a strong form of disinflation. Now, disinflation is still inflation, but it's lower inflation. And in terms of response functions, it, it, it bears a closer resemblance to deflation than it does to um, inflation, even though it's still a form of inflation. When interest rates are coming, sorry, when inflation is coming down, uh, what else is going on? Well, real interest rates are going up uh, and the economy is slowing down. And then it could even tip into deflation. That that would be uh, a shock to the system. I mean, that world cash is your best performing asset because the value of cash, the real value of cash actually goes up in uh, deflation when everything else is crashing around you. So, um, so yeah, we're in inflation right now. It's painful, um, but it's starting to fade more quickly than people expect. And my forecast, uh, based on a lot of analysis, and it's all in the book, uh, sold out, is that uh, this disinflation, borderline deflation will prevail. And by really just in a few months, January, February, March 2023, if not sooner, we're going to be in a very severe recession. Um, and uh, people are going to be surprised at, at how quickly inflation comes down, and they won't be positioned for it in terms of their portfolios. I mean, for example, a, a 10-year Treasury note would be a, a very good performing asset in this world because yield maturity on 10-year Treasury notes has been recently 4%, but now it's around 3.5%. That could come down to 2.5% in a, in a heartbeat, even lower, and that would produce huge capital gains. So it's, so it's a big deal for investors. And um, asset allocation and portfolio management. And uh, a lot of people don't see the uh, the disinflation coming. You mentioned supply side inflation tends to destroy itself. So I guess, and like, obviously the Fed's not responsible for the inputs on the supply chain side of things. Like you point out, they don't drill, they don't plant, whatnot. Right. So are they making a mistake by hiking here? Yes, they're making a huge mistake. The biggest, um, so the biggest question in markets today is, okay, we get it. The Fed told us what they're going to do, uh, but what's the terminal rate? And so let me define terminal rate so we know what we're talking about, and then I'll come back to that. So the terminal rate, no one knows what it is. Jay Powell doesn't know what it is. It's not like he knows he's not telling anybody. He doesn't know. The Board of Governors don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. But the terminal rate, by definition, is it's the rate that's high enough to cause inflation to come down on its own without more rate hikes. So, and a lot of people say, well, that means the rate has to be higher than inflation. That's not true. You could you could potentially uh, have a, 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 a terminal rate at say five and a quarter percent when inflation is still six or 7%. But the key is, is five and a quarter percent um, for the Fed funds rate, is that enough to get inflation to come down from seven to six to five to three to two on its own and if the answer is yes then you've hit the terminal rate so the terminal rate is the rate that causes inflation to come down on its own without further rate hikes powell is trying to get us to the terminal rate they don't know what it is they're guessing but it's kind of you know as potter seward used to say i'll know it when i see it um but um but my expectation is the fed's going to raise well 50 basis points in december i think we can you know, put put that in the books. Uh, the next Fed meeting after that is February 1st, and the one after that is March 22nd. Um, I would expect, based on what the Fed themselves are saying, um, and some leaks to their favorite reporter at the Wall Street Journal, uh, that they'll raise maybe 50 basis points on February 1st, and then maybe 25 on March 22nd. I mean, we'll know before it happens, but it's a couple months away. That's probably the best estimate. So another 75 basis points on top of 50 in December, that gets you to five and a quarter. Uh, and that's probably what Jay Powell thinks the terminal rate is. And they said, and then we're going to pause. So when we get there, remember, if the terminal rate 
and they're guessing, by the way, but if the terminal rate is below inflation, you have to wait for inflation to come down on its own. That's the whole idea. And how long will that take? And Powell's kind of like, might be a year. So in other words, the Fed's thinking it could be early to mid-2024 before they even think about cutting rates. That's the famous pivot. So here, here we see Wall Street in real time kind of bidding up tech stocks because the Fed's going to pivot and cut rates. Um, when in fact, Powell's thinking, no, that's not happening until 2024. And I keep telling you that, as I said, he gave four speeches and he's worried that no one's listening. So that's what the Fed thinks is happening. Uh, the market thinks that Powell is over tightening, that inflation will come down faster and the pivot will happen sooner. And that's why we've seen a little bit of a rally in stocks recently. So, so you, you have the Fed narrative, that's plan A. You have the market's version of what the Fed's actually doing, which is plan B. And now I'll tell you plan C, which is what's actually going on. Um, so the Fed's on the path I described. My estimate is that they, they're already past the terminal rate. They don't know it. They don't think so, but they are. And as I said, inflation is going to come down a lot faster than, than anyone expects. But but the markets are still factoring a soft landing, like, yeah, you know, rates come down, and uh, but the economy is strong, and inflation cools off, and the Fed has to cut rates, and you know, it's Goldilocks that we all live happily ever after. I would say the market's wrong about that. They're right that the Fed's probably over tightening. They're right that the um, inflation is going to come down faster than a lot of people expect. Um, and they're right that the Fed may have to cut sooner than the Fed expects. But it won't be that soon. It might be as might be June 2023 at the earliest. But by then, the damage will be done. And this is what Wall Street's missing, that... Uh, you know, it's like good news, bad news. The good news is the Fed might cut rates sooner than the Fed expects. The bad news is they're doing it for terrible reasons, which is you're in a severe recession, that the Fed has crashed the economy and stock markets are crashing. Explain to me how um, a severe recession is good for stocks. I've never seen that. I mean, at the end of a recession, you get a little rally maybe, but going into a recession, which is where we are, that's not good for stocks. So the, so the, the Fed has it wrong because they... They're missing the fact that everything works with a lag. The inflation's already coming down. They are going to overdo it, no question about it, and have to cut sooner than they think. So that's where the Fed's wrong. But the market's wrong in thinking that it's a soft landing in Goldilocks because, no, the Fed has really screwed this up, as they usually do. And um, they're going to cause a severe recession, and that's going to cause stocks to go down another you know, 30 40%, if not worse. Yeah. And as you point out, um, your prediction is that inflation will come down faster than folks expect. You talk about uh, disinflation, which I suppose is a cousin of deflation. But um, the possibility of that we could tip into deflation that you point out, that could be a real shock. Can you explain for the folks watching and listening um, why the deflation scenario is so worrisome? There are two reasons. First of all, the, the math, I always say I can do calculus, but usually don't need it. I mean, eighth grade math is or seventh grade math is sufficient for most of the hard economic problems. But one thing that's kind of counterintuitive, when you have deflation, which means, OK, prices are coming down. That's, that's all it is. So if, if you're used to hearing about inflation of 2 percent, 3 percent, 4 percent, inflation is when prices are negative 2 percent, negative 3 percent, negative 4 percent. Those prices are dropping. So how do we calculate real interest rates? Well, we take the nominal interest rate. That's the one you hear about on you know TV or you know read on on the web or you know headlines or whatever, and subtract inflation. So right now, um, you know, use I'll use the ten-year Treasury note. Uh, there you can use you can pick a lot of different rates and a lot of different inflation gauges. You have to specify, but I'll use the ten the yield to maturity on a ten-year Treasury note and CPI. So the yield of maturity and 10-year Treasury note is uh, 3.5%. And CPI, you know, round numbers, is about 7.5%. So what are real interest rates? Well, you have to do, you have to take um, 3.5 minus 7.5, and you get to negative 4. So real interest rates are actually negative. Uh, they're, as I say, negative 4%. So it's Three and you know the three point five minus seven point five equals minus four. So real interest rates are are negative. So um, that's that's highly stimulative, by the way. So it's why the Fed thinks they got to keep raising rates, um, which we just talked about. But now let's do the same math in a world of deflation. So let's say that um, 
uh, interest rates are two and a half percent. So yield mature in a 10 year knows two and a half percent. But deflation is negative two, meaning deflation is two. So inflation is negative two. That is what deflation is. So now when you do the math in that example, you get two and a half minus negative two. But when you subtract the negative, it's plus. You add the absolute value. So in that example, it'd be two and a half minus negative two equals four and a half. In that world, the real interest rate is four and a half percent. That's high. That's a huge real interest rate. Um, I mean, I remember my first mortgage was 13%. And my mother cried. She's like, because ah, her first mortgage was like two and a half percent. I said, yeah, but mom, it, you know, it, it's 13%, but inflation at the time was 15%. So I said, my real rate is negative two. And by the way, it's all tax deductible and it was a 50% bracket at the time. So it was really negative eight. I mean, I was stealing money because uh, of uh, the impact of taxes and inflation. So the 13% nominal rate was actually negative two because of 15% inflation. But here you have a situation where the nominal rate is way down to two and a half percent, but the real rate is four and a half if you have 2% deflation. So deflation is a killer because it it raises real rates even as nominal uh, prices are going down. So again, that's the kind of through the looking glass mentality when you have to. It's not, it's not complicated, but subtracting negatives is piling on. It's adding to the real rate, and that and that slows down growth even more. And that kind of deflation feeds on itself. And of course, that's exactly what we saw during the Great Depression. Now, there's another problem. It's even scarier, and this is a central banker's worst nightmare. Um, I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, et cetera, and they are. But um, but the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it, but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates, and maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect, and maybe it's painful. There are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? Can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but but that doesn't. Once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work, by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like nine trillion dollars, but the the empirical evidence is that it's just, you know, they 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 do QE by buying bonds from the banks, and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is, it doesn't do any good. So um, they actually. So you can take rates to zero, but you're stuck. Um, could you have negative interest rates? In theory, yes. In Europe, uh, Switzerland, and and a few, and Japan did, but there's no evidence that it provided any stimulus. I mean, they did it, but it's like an experiment that didn't work. So the problem with deflation is there's nothing a central bank can do, and it does feed on itself, and it does get worse, and that is a central banker's worst nightmare, and. However, a quick footnote, we did see this in the 1930s, well, between 1929 and 1933, during the first phase of the Great Depression. It was the Hoover administration. Then Franklin Roosevelt came in in 1933. And Roosevelt faced exactly the same problem. I mean, he shut every he shut every bank in America on like a second or third day in office by executive order. He closed every bank in America. Can you imagine the president of the United States today? I don't care if it's, you know, Biden or Trump or anybody else, Democrat or Republican, issuing an order saying Every bank is closed as of now. We'll get back to you when they're going to reopen. I mean, that's what FDR did uh, to, to break the banking panic. But he still had the deflation problem. And the Fed couldn't do anything. I talked to Ben Bernanke about this personally because Bernanke wrote a book on this. And I read the book. And I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, I said, Here, here's what I think you said. Did I get this right? And he said, yeah, that's it. You understand it correctly. Um, but the Fed couldn't and didn't do anything. So how did FDR break the back of deflation when the central banks were powerless? The answer is he raised the price of gold. He devalued the dollar against gold and raised the price of gold 75% from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. And that worked because it wasn't about rewarding holders of gold. In fact, he had confiscated all the gold beforehand, so it was like insider trading. But the idea of raising the price of gold was really to devalue the dollar so you could get the price of corn, wheat, steel, oil, get the price of everything else. up, And it worked. In the middle of the Great Depression, from 1933 to 1936, the market boomed. I mean, the economy did very well. But it was starting from such a low level, it was still depressed, but it did much better. You know, the 
the Democratic theme song was Happy Days Are Here Again. Then in 1937, the Fed screwed it up again and caused a second recession in the Great Depression. And that's why they call it the Great Depression. But um, but the devaluation of the dollar against gold worked. It, nothing the central bank could do would work. So to kind of just to round up the discussion, Julia, um, uh, deflation is um, very, uh, very troubling and should be to central bankers, economists, and everyday citizens, everyday Americans, because it raises real interest rates really steeply. It feeds on itself, and there's nothing central banks can do about it. And the only thing that has ever worked is devaluing the dollar against gold. So uh, it's, one, it's one reason to have gold. And they wouldn't even have that tool in this scenario. Just a quick follow-on, though, to it. Um, what would that, like, if we are in a deflationary scenario, what would that mean, not just for the U.S. economy, but even globally? What would some of the ramifications be? Yeah, great question. This is everything I'm describing. I'm, we've been focusing on the U.S., but the U.S. is the world's largest economy, and the dollar is the world's largest payment currency and reserve currency, et cetera. So it's a good place to start. But we're looking at a global recession, and those are rare. As I said before, uh, it's one thing if Germany has a recession or Japan or the U.S., but usually there's another economy or economic group that's doing okay or at least better and can kind of pull everybody out of the rut. Um, but global recessions where everybody is declining uh, are rare, and that's what's happening. And that's what that's what we had in 2008. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So, uh, so the U.S. is heading for one. We've just talked about that at length. Japan's in a recession. Europe's in a recession. China's in a recession. Um, India's, you know, having some tough times. Um, and a lot of this is dollar related. All the other countries, you know, I mentioned Switzerland, uh, uh, India, China, Japan have all seen their U.S. dollar reserves go down. And everyone's like, oh, they hate the, they hate the dollar. They're dumping the dollar. No, it's the opposite. They, they, they don't have enough dollars. So they're selling treasuries to get dollars to bail out their own banks because there's a dollar shortage. So the fact that you see those dollar reserves coming down does not mean that they hate the dollar. It means that they need dollars, that they're short of dollars, and they're so desperate that they are selling treasury securities to get dollars to bail out their own banking systems. So we're well on the way to a global recession. Um, and if you say, well, you, know, you got communism, uh, socialism, uh, capitalism, uh, all these different economic systems, all part of this globalized system, how could they all be on the same wavelength at the same time? Well, the common thread is the dollar. It's the U.S. dollar. And, you know, about 60% of global reserves, 80% um, of global payments. Um, it's the benchmark for every other currency. So when you talk about the euro, you, you, you're you quoting dollars. You're saying it's a dollar five or a dollar four gold. You know, you say, well, it's $1,800 an ounce, whatever. The point being, even when you're talking about a commodity or currency that's not a dollar per se, you reference it in dollars. Uh, same with oil, world market, it's all dollar oriented. So the dollar is the thread that runs through the whole global system. And it, it's a partial explanation for why everything's falling apart at once. Makes sense. Um, I know you only have a couple more minutes, so I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, asset allocation uh, could be helpful for the folks watching and listening. What are you thinking about in terms of asset allocation um, for these more turbulent or uncertain times that you see ahead? Sure. Um, I'm going to say something that is going to sound so obvious that people will roll their eyes, but it's actually not obvious because very few people understand it. Um, so the key and the kind of, so we just talked about inflation, deflation, disinflation, global recession, some economies worse than others, supply chain breakdowns, so many, you know, the war in Ukraine, so many variables uh, that you can give different scenarios. You can, uh, you know, say inflationary and deflationary scenarios. So how do you survive that? Uh, what's the optimal asset allocation method? Well, the key is diversification. And when you say diversification, people roll their eyes. They go, oh, of course, everybody knows that. Diversification is good and all that. But the problem is they don't understand what diversification is. And I run into people all the time and they go, Jim, I'm, I'm highly diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, mines and minerals, you know, consumer non durables. So I'm highly diversified. And I say, no, you're not. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks. And they're all going to go down together or go up together, as the case may be. But particularly in times of stress, they become highly correlated. So having 50 different stocks or ETFs or whatever is not diversification. That's just 
having a whole bunch of bets in one asset class. So what does real diversification look like? Well, you should have some, you know, 10 year treasury notes, or if they're a little too volatile for your taste, look at a five year note or a two year note um, that will um, basically give you very, uh, 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 you know, the, the credit secure, I'm not doubting the credit of the United States, but that will give you a deflation every hedge. If we get into disinflation and deflation where interest rates are coming down, which I do expect, you're going to get very good capital gains on those notes, or you're going to be very happy with the coupon in the meantime. Um, real estate, uh, definitely. Uh, not so much commercial real estate, too soon for that, but multifamily housing, residential real estate, farms, other kinds of income producing real estate for a slice. Good slice of cash, maybe as much as 30%. And people hate cash. They go, ah, I don't get a yield on cash. You know, cash is a waste of my time, et cetera. Um, it's true that it has very low yield, but but number one, it uh, performs very well in deflation, which we talked about. Uh, but more importantly, um, cash is, is the opposite of leverage. It reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So if you have volatile, volatile investments in the wings, Cash is a, a, you know, it's like a bar connecting to two ends of the barbell. Uh, it has very low volatility, but most importantly, it gives you optionality. If if you see stock markets crashing and burning the way I expect, the way I described, the person with cash can go out and go shopping in the ruins. And by the way, Warren Buffett has, Berkshire Hathaway has over $130 billion in cash. Why does Buffett have so much cash. Well, he sees what I see. We're, we're looking at the same thing, which is a kind of meltdown where the person with cash can basically go go shopping for bargains. Definitely a slice of gold for the reasons we talked about. That'll be your inflation hedge. Um, but but 10%, you know, people always say, you know, Jim Rickers will sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think that's a good idea. But 10%, yes, yeah, so that, that's a good slice. Um, uh, you know, private equity, if you can have access to good deals, that's that's a separate category. Uh, and so so a, so a model portfolio, you'd have a slice of treasury notes, um, a slice of cash, uh, have some stocks, but I would focus on, uh, um, for example, energy, you know, BP, Exxon, uh, Mobile, Shell, Marathon, uh, this green new scam thing, forget it. Uh, it, it. It's a big deal, I mean, from a policy point of view, but it's infeasible. I've studied the science very closely. It's it's going to go away. But in the meantime, if you, if you bash the oil and natural gas companies, but you're going to need the oil and natural gas, which we do, then those stocks are going to do well. Um, real estate, I mentioned, uh, and, uh, and and gold. So that that would be a really diverse portfolio that would have five or six different asset classes. And some will outperform others. You know, Some will do better in inflation. Some will do better in disinflation. But that's the whole idea with this much uncertainty. Uh, and your winners, your winners, pardon me, winners will outnumber your losers. Uh, and cash is like a thermostat. You know, you can reduce cash and buy a little more gold or reduce cash and buy a few more stocks if that's warranted. So that's what a, I think an ideal portfolio looks like. Well, Jim, I always learn something new every time I talk to you. I'm so excited to read Sold Out, How Broken Supply Chains, Surging Inflation, and Political Instability Will Sink the Global Economy. And I encourage the folks out there watching and listening to go ahead and pick up a copy. Jim Rickards, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your ideas. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Julia. Hey, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe, and that bell so you won't miss any new videos.